We're going to be talking about using change management in EHR implementations and adoptions. Right now, all your lines are muted. If you need to post some questions, go ahead and put them in the question pane. And I will be reading those um, after Dr. Carius's presentation, which will be in the middle of our presentation of slides, and then also at the end. You're able to raise your hand. It is hard for me to determine um, you know, if, if hands are raised at the time that I'm doing presentations. So if you can just enter them into the, the question pane, it will be great. EHR and implementations are large organizational projects. And as we know, that three-legged stool of a project is about people, processes, and technology. Of the three, people are the most important. And the focus of change management is the people. And the purpose is to change behaviors. The overarching objective of today's presentation is to give you strategies and tactics to accelerate the speed at which people move successfully through change process so that anticipated benefits are achieved faster. We're going to skip a couple there and come back to Dr. Iscarius. Now I know as a change agent that um, sometimes I feel like I come to the um, table with a change or a project and I'm kind of Glenda the Good Witch. I'm hoping that good things are going to be happening, that people are going to be glad to see me. Um, but sometimes, and which is most of the time, the perception from their end is actually that this is who I am. And usually the projects, um, I always think that they really are the yellow brick road to Oz of the new benefits of the project and, and the things that we can all gain from them. But most of the time, it is the haunted forest, and um, people feel like they want to turn back. So I have to be very aware as a change agent of the changes that we're implementing that these things are happening to people. And the things that they do every day, they may have built their business upon the way they've done business in the past 10 years, or they may have built their career image on this, or even their self-image. So we never take these changes lightly. At HealthPoint, we wanted to um, bring together some, just some helpful guidelines to help you make sure that your project is not that haunted for us. We've adapted the Cotter's Eight Steps for Change model to show how this model works in the healthcare setting. And the eight steps are create urgency, form a powerful coalition, create a vision for change, communicate the vision for buy-in, Remove obstacles and empowering action. Create short-term wins. Build on change and consolidate improvements. And then anchor and institutionalize the new corporate culture. So in the next few slides, I'm going to identify what you can do for each one of these steps, where to look at it, look for it within your organization, and then how to implement it. First off is step one, creating urgency. Urgency really is that fuel that drives the change process. So you need to find urgency within your organization. Here's some places to look. You need to identify, uh, or you could identify potential threats or crises. And this could be done, you could look at data security or breach threats, um, potential impending or current Medicare payment cuts. You can find those by monitoring the flow of um, data, addressing issues with that, any notifications that you've received for, um, and any financial constraints that you've in, encountered, and also your security risk assessment would show um, some of those threats that you have for the organization. That can create some urgency. You can explore your quality performance opportunities. In your quality tracking, you may find that there may be opportunities to have improvement, and you can create urgency behind that. You could also discuss scenarios of things that could happen in the future, some trends that you may see in the industry, um, and you could, um, and you could um, use the promotion for certain things like e-prescribing or um, charge captors, secure reminders, or secure messaging. Having honest and dynamic discussions 
of the benefits of electronic health records or computerized um, order entry. These types of discussions will um, help answer people's, concern, people's concerns and you can really talk to them about um, data and the questions that they may have. And also then providing evidence from outside the organization. Um, you can talk to clinicians, talk about what their needs are, JCO safety rules. So all the time looking for something that will um, validate that this is an urgent matter within the organization. Step two, you want to form a powerful coalition. This is where you're going to identify your true leaders. Look at the people who have influence, power, and credibility within your organization. These are usually clinic directors, um, CIOs, nurses, expert IT staff. Attract key change leaders and group them. Look for those enthusiastic people, people who are committed, focused, and have a positive attitude. You might not find them in the places you had expected. There may be people in billing or IT or the front desk or in nursing. Incorporating team building activities within your um, coalition using brainstorming, frequent um, information sharing. Always doing a SWOT analysis of your coalition or your group of people. And identifying those weak areas. You want to have a good mix of people that are complementary. I'm going to take a moment just right here to see if Dr. Icarius is on the line. Doctor, can you hear us? Okay. Not yet. Okay, that's all right. We'll keep trying. We'll keep plugging along. He'll join us. Me? Can you hear me? I can, Dr. Carius. Hello. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I've tried it like six times, and so you can hear me now. I'm on a cell phone. I couldn't get it to work on any other phone. Okay, great. Well, it's good to have you. And actually, this is a a great place for you to come in. It was kind of divine intervention here. I'm going to roll back to Dr. Acarius's slides because this is um, some of the things he's going to be talking about. So if you can just give me a moment to do that. Sure. Sorry, I had trouble with. That's okay. It happens on these things. All right. Let's just move back to that and. Um, Dr. Carey, would you like me to um, run the presentation, or you want me to give you, ac um, you know, access to it? You can go ahead. I, okay. I just have a couple slides, but mainly I just, you know, want to run through some things that Jan had talked to me about. Yeah. About, I guess uh, remaining concerns about adoption and so forth. All right. Well, everyone, I'd like to welcome our esteemed guest, Dr. Scott Acarius. In addition to his ophthalmology practice in Rapid City, Dr. Acarius has served as the Medical Informatics Officer at Regional Health in Rapid City since 2007. In that capacity, he advocates for clinical information systems, their value to the patients, and the organizational imperative of meaningful use. The Acarius Eye Clinic implemented an EHR system seven years ago and currently uses Athena Health's practice management system, EHR, and their patient portal software. In addition, Dr. Carey serves as Athena Health's national, uh, serves on the Athena Health's national physician advisory board. So welcome, Dr. Carey, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I guess when I spoke the other day about, with Jan, about what the specific things you guys were going to address, um, I was asked to speak largely on, you know, there's still some places that adoption is an issue. Uh, I think there's a lot of places that have adoption within the hospital systems and probably within individual offices about how do you get people to uh, get to the next step of actually having a fully functional EHR. I, I think if you look across the state, there are probably very few places left uh, where clinics do not have either in the stages of implementing an EHR 
uh, or actually already have one, but just may not have optimized what they can do with it, which is different than when I took this job five to seven years ago. Uh, no one had one in their in their office for a handful of the healthcare organizations that were had affiliated practices uh, were rolling out the ambulatory pieces of their uh, basically legacy systems that they had in their hospital. So in five years, we've gone from nearly uh, very little adoption to almost complete adoption. So uh, I guess what I would, unless people can tell me what it specifically they would like to hear, uh, I would just try to uh, frame it such that for the remaining people who are struggling with adoption, not sure they want to do it yet. If they have done it, not sure they're getting the most out of it, how to maybe push them uh, to the point of being more successful. Does that sound acceptable? Yes, definitely. Go ahead. I have your strategic planning um, slide up for you. Yeah, I can see it. Well, I mean, this could apply to about anything, and it could apply to whether you're going to create, a, you know, a health information exchange. It could apply to how you're going to run your business. It could apply to how you're going to run your department, your hospital. It could actually apply to, you know, how you're going to engage an enemy in battle, uh, which is the source from which I got. Uh, this information. It's pretty, it's pretty standard stuff, but you know what? It's so simple and standard that hardly anybody ever does it. And I guess one of the things that I, when, you're, when you're trying to decide what to do, and it, no, make no mistake, uh, putting EMR in is uh, not for the faint of heart. I mean, it does change your world a lot. And so what do you want to get out of it? So establishing a precise goal or two or three or four uh, I think would be wise for anybody going into uh, to doing this and and put it in writing so that you look back after six weeks and you say you know look you know we plan to have you know two doctors up the first two weeks and then add three more doctors the next two weeks are in your strategic plan how, how did you plan to get there what do you want to do if you want to try to do everything all at once I can guarantee you you're never going to if you're going to do four things at once, you're going to do four things 25% rather than do one thing 100% and move to the next. So like in our clinic, we have uh, we have a practice management system that's Athena, we have an EMR that's Athena, and we have a portal or a communicator system that's Athena. And, but we didn't do it all on day one. I mean, we did the practice management system, and then about a half year later, we did the EMR, and then we did about a half year after that, we did the portal or the communication piece. So I would advise people that are, you know, planning to do such a thing is to, you know, break it up into bite-sized pieces. You make a commitment, put it in writing, and you know, don't overreach. And and then evaluate your courses of action. And you know, obviously the pros are going to be you're going to get meaningful use money, right? Uh, you're going to have a, uh, you know, you're not going to pull charts. You're not going to you're going to save all the money you were spending on dictation. You're going to spend the, you know. Uh, you're going to have a safer system for your patients. You're going to have quicker lookups. Those are the pros, but the cons are always going to be, you know, what's my productivity and how much money am I going to leave on the table in those early months? Because that's not a small issue. So, you know, you have to look back. How are you going to execute those courses of action? And, you know, obviously you know, the execution is going to be critical to carrying this out. And if you plan to lose money, or not see as many patients, which is the same thing in the first you know month or two, then you have to decide. I mean, how much am I going to cut my practice back? How much am I going to? Because you don't want to keep your practice running exactly the same, at least initially, uh, and then find out that you know you're there until 7:30 at night finishing your records uh, if you normally went home at five. So you need a little bit of advanced planning. Uh, I'm a, even though we've done big bang approaches in our hospital organization and in some of our clinics, at least on the practice management side, you almost have to. Uh, with the EMR, I particularly like not particularly don't like bringing ten up at once. 
Uh, I don't think you can stay with some on paper, some electronic for very long because people looking in two places for records. But you know, you need to. It's not. It's not a bad idea to stage it, but have a goal in mind at the end. By this date, you know, all ten doctors are going to be using it. Uh, I, I think those are the things that, that I have found to be uh, helpful when we helped clinics and done it in our own clinic. Any questions at this point? I don't see any in the queue yet, Doctor. Okay. okay. Well, go, I only have two slides, so let me go have you go to the next one. And this is kind of the uh, the question is, you know, why do you do this? And this is uh, from an advisory board consulting group out of Washington, D.C. that I've, I've used this slide probably, you know, ten times in the last four years. And uh, the U.S. part here, uh, we're actually getting into the flat part of the curve. So you can see, you know, stage one is, again, that, that first third of the graph on the x-axis is you know, meeting the meaningful use mandate. And that's what everybody probably that's on this call is really looking at right now. You know, you reinforce your core systems. Maybe you've gone to an updated Windows version of something that you know will, will be certified for EA for meaningful use now. You know, if you're in the hospital system, you're going to maximize your CPOE or your computerized physician order entry utilization. And then you're going to try to, like everybody, you're going to try to exchange data, which is proving to be somewhat difficult in a lot of uh, uh, in a lot of areas across the country, unless you have a single system like an Epic or a Meditech or something like that, uh, and you can see that first part of the curve. It's a fairly steep climb, uh, with the y-axis being your hospital, or you could substitute your clinic's performance. Is that you know you really gain a lot of uh, a lot of power in the system that you're hit this flat with patient for analytics, and that's I think where a lot of hospital organizations are now. Uh, in that your your hospital performance doesn't go up much, uh, and but you still are spending a lot of time on the y, on the x-axis there, and that's where you're trying to take the data that you've that you've gathered from your EMR. You're building a team that will then be able to analyze it, so you're upskilling your talent and your analytics team, and then you're going to find that your data is crappy. You're going to find out that a lot of data that you gather, you know wasn't really high quality data. So you got to go back and you got to make sure that you know that the the demographical information was right. That you didn't have four Mary Johnsons when you know there were only two, that type of thing. And then finally, and I'll quit with this, in the stage in the third stage is really where everybody wants to get and why we really do this. Is that you have to digitize everything to get it into a format that you can analyze it. And then in that third stage, and again then then the 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 slope of that curve becomes very steep disease and then ultimately population health, you know, prevent disease. Or if you're if you're looking at risk uh, risk based uh, insurance plans, you know, you can actually see whether or not you have the analytics to be able to take on that risk, whether you're a clinic or you're a hospital organization. So we're doing this all right now in the first stage, trying to get through the second, which is not going to be uh, particularly easy to get to the third one. And it's all happening pretty fast. And if you're just starting now, I mean, I think, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're definitely, they've shot the gun at the starting line of the, of the track meet. But because it's been a tough spot for so many people, you can get there fairly quickly uh, with real commitment. And so I would encourage you all to, to do so if you haven't begun already. Any questions? I'm not seeing any in the queue, but if anyone would like to raise their hand, I can go ahead and unmute your line to ask a question. Well, I'll stay on the call, uh, you know, with the rest of your presentation. If anything comes up, I'll, I'll stay on until the end. All right. Thanks, Dr. Akarius. That was great information. And really is it shows that um, the leadership in, in change management and the vision of where we're going um, 
is part of probably one of the most important things in change management because for people to understand and have buy-in, they must know what the vision is, and this is a great representation of that, so thank you. I'm going to move back to our step three in our change management, and this really was what you were talking about. And it, like I said, it was, it was great timing for you to come on at that time. So I'm just going to go through these quickly because you did um, indicate about setting the goals and determining what it is that you want to do. So um, determining that value, I know you've heard this from HealthPoint several times, that um, determining what the value is in the project and connecting that to the value of the organization is very important. So um, understanding your vision and like Dr. Carey said, making those goals so you can break them into understandable and brief messages within your organization. Um, develop um, summaries that have either catchy phrases or visualizations to see what's happening, handouts that can convey the message. Developing the strategies to execute. This is where um, Dr. Carius was talking about involving that key leadership and setting the goals there. The coalition team um, should be able to describe their vision in five minutes or less. So I think we call this the elevator speech. Um, practice it. And within your, your meetings, um, have people give their elevator speech of what this vision is because really they, they will be the ones that will be um, moving this forward. So step four is communicating that vision for buy-in. Now here you're going to talk about change um, often, conveying that message at meetings, emails, have it as your tagline in your email, be very open and honest in answering people's concerns and anxieties, and give them validation that those are good questions and things that we should talk about. Um, and you can put out, don't be scared to put out thought-provoking questions out there to get feedback from people so you understand where they are in terms of in the, in the buy-in and making sure they understand the vision. Applying the vision um, to all aspects of operations, as the, Dr. Carius illustrated to us in that um, the, the graph that we are moving towards where the, we do have the upswing and it shows that we are treating illnesses by evidence-based medicine and that um, the care is then affected by the quality that we see. Leading by example, encourage that the coalitions are walking, are walking the talk and uh, making sure that their behavior backs their words. Using every communication tool that you have Screensavers within enterprise-wide um, organizations, you can put up a screensaver that talks about the message. Um, presentations that are short to the point, and, and you could have cafeteria tent cards. So communicating that vision is your next step. And then step five, remove any obstacles and empower them to action. Look at your roles and responsibilities within the organization and really engage people in the organization to help further um, the coalition's work. Reward people who are embracing change and, and use them as motivation to talk to other people. Identify people that are resisting change. You want to know who those people are and what their questions are because if you can ask for reasons or give rationales of, of what their oppositions are to the issues, then you'll be able to address those at a larger scale. Take action strategically. Make sure you address things very quickly. Discuss it with the team. Always track the issues and the resolutions. You will need those in the future as well. Step six, create short-term wins. Always when you're setting goals and <laughs> looking at the project, make sure you set a short-term goal that's very achievable so you can celebrate that win. Um, analyze the pros and cons of the target, like Dr. Carey says. What are those things? that are going to be the benefits and the risks within this project and reward those people who are, um, are in, involved in that improvement and encourage them and make sure they're very visible to the rest of the organization or your practice. Step seven, you're going to continue to build on the change and consolidate the improvement. Analyze all the wins, things that went wrong, things that went right, have debrief sessions, um, when you're looking at your goals and for future next steps, 
continue to build on any momentum that has already been achieved so you can set goals for the future. Um, if your organization doesn't know about continuous quality improvement or Kaizen or Agile or Lean, make sure that that idea and those theories and principles of quality improvement are embedded across the organization, especially on change. Keep the ideas fresh. Bring new people in. Different backgrounds and experience are always best to have fresh eyes on these things. And then step six, anchoring the new culture. Talk about the progress that has been made in the, in the project every chance you get, success stories, share things within your organization, and also things out in the nation as well in the industry. Um, include change values and ideas regularly. Articulate the connections between new behaviors and the corporate success. So when you are presenting quality reports that show peaks or valleys, and you can I identify where the changes occurred, and what the result was, if it was an increase in um, you know, revenue or if it was a decrease in patient wait time. Show that those things um, did have correlation to the project and the ideals that you were bringing forward in your change project. Um, recognize key players publicly. Make sure that people know um, what their contributions were. And always prepare for replacements. People who are your, um, your leader sometimes do move on to new projects, but those that um, stay or are the next ones to take their place um, should know um, and be ready for them as they come on. So that's how you look at change from pre preparation and getting ready for change. Now, I think all of us probably know that when you're the, the person who changes happening to, that things aren't as cut and dry, that there's a lot of emotion involved as well. So at HealthPoint, we put together a guide sheet for you, and it's based on the Briggs transition model. And it really is guiding people who are being impacted by change. And we really felt that um, this was one area that was being missed in all of the discussions about change management. This really validates the feelings of the people who are having EHR adoption processes and offers them solutions to get through each stage. You can find this on our website. So stage one is when people have been notified about the change. They can expect to feel denial, fear, anger, sadness, a lot of uncertainty happens at this point. Your job is to make sure that the communication you are giving is um, positive and that it is supportive. People at this point, they really need to talk about this change in um, healthy and positive manners. Um, avoid that negative Nelly in the office, and we all know who that is. Make sure that you have all the facts available to people um, to make an educated opinion about the benefits and risks, the pros and cons. Stage two, um, this is where the change is happening in real time, and people can expect to have some resentment about the change. They may be doing, as Dr. Carey said, talked about the, the two systems, maybe doing the old and the new. And they may want to hold on to the old ways because they're more comfortable. There's going to be some anxiety about their roles, some skepticism about the change because you are seeing low productivity, which does have some effect on morale. At this point, change agents must provide strong support and lots of direction and communication. Stage three, um, this is where they're embracing the change where they are becoming more open to learning. They're seeing some of the benefits on not only their day-to-day -day work, but within the organization and also the patients that they serve. Um, so this is um, one of those opportunities that you have to then get them to um, continue to bring that message forward that um, this is a positive change. Now, change is never easy. And fear is at the, the root of most opposition to change. So we felt if you're validating people and the feelings that they're having, that you're going to find that the time from stage one to um, stage three is shortened. 
I've provided some just some references um, to the the Cotter model and also um, a, a website called Mind Tools, which I recommend to everyone. And then our website, you will find all of these resources as well. Well, in summary, I think um, we can wrap this all up to say that change is the constant of life. Planning and communication are key. And to remember that the people are being impacted and they must be considered how they are impacted. Well, on behalf of HealthPoint and the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, we wanted to thank Dr. Carius for being our guest speaker today. And thanks to you for attending. There will be a survey sent to you via SurveyMonkey to allow you to provide feedback to the speakers and to also let us know what topics you're most interested in. The slide deck for today's presentation will be available on our website. Our next webinar will take place on April 22nd at noon, and the topic will be online training for your healthcare staff. So be sure to join us for that.